Well, uh, uh, danke schön, uh, Professor Granau and uh, Bernard Sachs. Entschuldigung, meine Deutsch, Deutsche ist uh, schrecklich. <laughs> so I won't attempt any more German. Um, I uh, am very glad to be back in uh, Germany again. It's been some years, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, you may know I'm, I'm, my mother is German. Uh, my father is Greek, uh, so recently, interesting discussions at home. <laughs> um, but we can, we can talk about that during the day. Um, so I have about an hour, and uh, I want to uh, talk about um, a few things, um, Moodle included. Um, let's see, you got that up there? So, yeah, look, I want to talk about how to build a good Moodle course, but also how to build pretty much anything, I think. A bit of, uh, so it's a bit of reflection, a bit of didactics, a bit of, um, let's go back to some thinking about why we're doing things and, and how we're doing them. Um, if you want to make comments, tweet as well. In, in German's fine, because I can translate easily online, so it's quite, it's quite handy for me. First of all, though, Let's look at this, uh, hang on. <laughs> These two guys, uh, we've got, uh, one of them's called Dieter Noor, I believe. Um, the other one is uh, uh, someone who lived in a cave many thousands of years ago. Uh, what's the difference between these two people? Anybody got some suggestions? What's the fundamental difference? Anyone? Come on. Give me some, call out something. Less hair, that's a <laughs> pretty superficial difference. Happier, he's a bit, yeah, uh, probably happier, could be. But it's an interesting question if he's happier. Any other suggestions? What else? What's some differences? Yeah. <laughs> well, the caveman had his cave. Um, yeah. And a web, probably, in the corner. Sorry, what? Right. <laughs> Is his words, I suppose. Well, <clears throat> the clothes, maybe. They both have clothes. So. But uh, look, there's a lot of little differences. But fundamentally, um, they have the same brain. They have a lot of different behaviours, a lot of different externals, a lot of different culture. But they have the same brain, exactly. There's no, no evolution in this period that's significant. Um, so why all these differences? Well, you know, you know I'm going to talk about education, of course. But the, the same brain is subject to different interactions with what's around it. So there is an environment around them. We are always interacting with our environment, and we have a feedback loop with this environment. We affect our environment, our environment affects us. Part of the environment is other people, of course. We have human beings, we have very rich languages and communication uh, on a much more abstract level. So our culture around us, we have a feedback loop. This is very fundamental to how we learn and how we act. And thirdly, we also have reflection inside. We, we, we're thinking, we have a feedback loop internally which governs our behaviours and uh, our actions. So let me talk about those in a bit more detail, some examples. Uh, very important is our, uh, our body, how we use our body in the world. Uh, how many people here have children? I assume quite a few of you. Okay. Um, oh, gone too far. I, I had to suddenly jump to an iPad version of this talk, and so it's a bit finicky. Here we go. We're lagging. Let's get back. So I'm sure you remember, with your children, that, oh, not again. It's, it's lagging terribly. It's like after every click, it takes five seconds. What's going on here? You remember with your children, remember when they were babies? And there is a very cute baby here, over there. You remember when they're, when they're this age, um, they, you can watch them bootstrapping themselves up. It's like a computer operating system booting up, and they're building fundamentals. So they'll have something dangling in front of them, and you, you watch their arms do this, 
and you know, they obviously want to touch it, they're looking at it, and somehow their hand might hit the thing. And when they do, there's a little feedback loop caused. The, 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 the parts of the brain that are uh, electric, that are alight at that moment, the synapses, have made their arm move like that, and they had a positive success. And so it's reinforced that to make your hand go there, you have to do those actions. And when you're watching that in children, and it goes round and round, and they, they uh, you know, you watch them reaching for things, and then very soon they're starting to take your keys and go out with them in the car. <laughs> and, um, and it's, you know, an obvious way of how we learn. Oh, come on, there we go. So there's another example here of like someone sort of pottery. You're making things. You're creating something. You're making a, a thing, whether it's a website or a piece of pottery. Um, you have feedback from that object. You can feel it. You can experience it. And uh, you modify your movements, your actions, to create that thing into the shape that, you've, that you want. If you're learning to drive, you have a feedback loop from the car. The car is obviously, hopefully, not crashing into a wall. Um, and you can feel how the engine's going and all those sorts of things. But you also usually have to have someone beside you to talk in your ear and say, you're doing the right thing, you're not doing the right thing, do more of this, do less of that, please can I get out of the car, this sort of thing. Um, this is never more obvious than in, in sport, where coaching is the way most elite sport works. It, everybody in the Olympics will have some coach, pretty much. It's very rare you can be very good at sport without a coach. And the coach is there to provide the feedback loops that you need. You get feedback from competition, of course. You, you ha you're against other people and you can see how you're performing, better and worse. Um, but if you have someone in your, giving you this perspective from the outside, telling you uh, you're doing better or you're doing something wrong or uh, your foot is in the wrong place, etc. That's the best way to learn. And now with computers we have a lot more feedback, feedback um, where the computers can analyse what we're doing and give us um, some information about what we're doing. And so in health you see this is quite a trend, especially at the moment. There's lots of devices that are designed to give ourselves health feedback. Um, Yes, we all look in the mirror and we think, yeah, we could lose a couple of kilograms. That's one form. But um, the feedback from these devices is more rich. It's things like your temperature and so on. And there was a really interesting uh, talk that I saw where um, a woman m monitored her own temperature all day, every day, for something like three or four years. And she developed some very interesting um, you know, rhythms and, and, and got to know how her temperature operated. And it, just from that one variable, she was able to determine there was a time when she had, she actually became pregnant and she had a miscarriage. And there was no other indication really than this temperature. And she, she thought something's happened here. Um, and it turned out later when a doctor looked into it deep, that that's what had happened. But her temperature told her this. And so even with a very small piece of data, you can actually find out interesting things. I'll talk more about that later. Down the bottom there, that's the new Apple Watch. Um, of course, hasn't been released yet, so we don't, we don't, uh, we don't know what it looks like. Um, in business, we, have, uh, we set up a lot of feedback um, processes. Uh, we have uh, performance reviews with the staff, and that's where you have someone who p presumably, a manager, knows what you're doing is able to give you useful feedback about how you're doing that in the ideal situation, that's what occurs. Uh, also there's uh, feedback from colleagues and things like 360 degree performance appraisals where you have everybody f giving feedback to everybody and the, the idea is that you know where you, where you are and how you're performing. But business also has a lot of other feedback loops. They have key performance indicators. How is the organisation doing as a whole. It's kind of important to have some metric so that you know if you're doing better or not. Um, and it can be one or many. Businesses look to talk to customers for feedback. Um, do you have the same problem here as we have in Australia with some very large like telecom companies where they uh, have 
so much support that you can't actually get anything done. So, so when you ring the help for to have some help and you get passed from this department to that department to that department, you know, and at the end, how was your experience? We want to improve, but there's so much of it, it can be overdone. But um, it's, it is good to know, to, to have that opportunity to give feedback quickly and to actually, if they listen to the feedback, theoretically, they should improve. And market research, of course, is important. How do you know that what you're doing is even going to be useful for anybody? In software, we have a lot of feedback going on. Um, in my own company, in the Moodle company that does the core development of Moodle, we have about 30 people. And we have very uh, detailed review processes that we've developed over time. And so any new change that comes into the software has to go through at least three different people at different levels to review, is the code good? Is it doing the right thing? Is it causing unexpected problems? And it's a heavy process. But by the end, by doing that, we hopefully avoid a lot of problems later on because the software is doing as best as possible. Um, so, unfortunately, I'm not getting to write much code anymore, but I still do occasionally get involved in reviewing other people's code. Uh, we also get a lot of feedback in, in Moodle's case through, from the users, from you, um, through a Moodle tracker and our forums. Um, and this is a very critical part that I want to get to um, later in this talk. But um, we have discussions, thousands of discussions going on about every aspect of Moodle, very, very small things sometimes. And this is really symptomatic of the world today. With the internet, we're all connected. We're all giving each other a lot of feedback. Social media is really a big feedback mechanism. Uh, when you post something, when you put some opinion out there on social media, we all feel good when somebody retweets it, or comments, replies to it, or favourites it, uh, or if it's Facebook and they like it. Um, we're all kind of seeking feedback, some um, uh, feelings for about what we're saying. Are we being validated? Are we saying the right thing or the wrong thing? Or maybe we don't care. But um, on the internet now, we're connected with so many people. We all have a group of people who um, you know, we feel part of and we, we're supported by. That's why this Moodle move is so good because most people outside Moodle don't really understand what we do and we're very much a mix of education and uh, technology and even business all in there together. But uh, yeah, social media is obviously just, it just takes off because it's this feedback loops within feedback loops and that's why it works. So all of this is, is feedback. And I keep saying this word because I'm hoping that if you remember nothing else from this hour, and let's face it, we all have bad memories, just remember feedback. And if you can think of that at some point in your own work, maybe it'll help you um, with it. When I looked at what's happening in education, and how many people here have some, you know, and, uh, are teachers actually, I'd be interested to know, actually teaching day to day with students. Not so many actually, about 10, 15, 20, unless you're just shy. Uh, how many people here are more administrators running departments, uh, managing people, this sort of thing, about the same number? <laughs> uh, how many people here are students? Officially, a couple, a few, a few people. What are the rest of you doing? <laughs> what, yeah, anyone? What, tell me something, what are you doing? What's this? Development. Development? Okay, web developing, okay. Uh, designers, anyone designers here? Sort of more creative, yeah. Anything else? Someone? Counseling. Counseling, all right, cool. Okay, that's sort of a teaching in a way, but yes. That's a very good feedback position, actually, in counselling. Um, so in education, these are not all of the strategies in education, um, but there are lots of them. And if you look at them, a lot of them are really opportunities to give feedback for, for learning, whether it's from the teacher, from peers, from content. They are about developing these kind of feedback loops. And so for me, I kind of see feedback as the universal law of education. Um, 
And it's quite <coughs> kind of very useful to think of things in that way. If we go back to uh, when I started Moodle, it was part of my PhD, and I had uh, a framework that I used, which I pulled from the literature, um, which I used as a reference. It was my decision-making star, if you like. So whenever I had to make a decision, should I develop things this way or that way, I would look to the, my theory, my reference, and I would say, yes, this way is better. And that would help guide me. And so I was using this concept of social constructionism, which is the idea that you put artifacts, you, you, you must create things and put them out there for other people to give you feedback, for people to, uh, to see and to talk about and to reply and respond. In Moodle, the, the main idea was that it shouldn't be the teacher who's the, in the middle. The teacher should be a facilitator and everybody in the class should be um, given opportunities to demonstrate their knowledge and give feedback to each other because then you can scale. Then you can have feedback um, faster and more often. So really, all, of, all this social constructionism thing was is really just how to get better feedback. So what is good educational feedback? There is stuff that is good feedback and there's stuff that's not good feedback. So this is based on research into feedback in education. The first thing is re good educational feedback should be goal-based. You should all have a goal. The students should know what they're trying to learn and the teachers should know that's what they're trying to teach and that way things stay on track. Random feedback is less, less useful. It should provide an external view. So the feedback should be somebody saying, from my point of view, you're doing this. Uh, this is how it looks to me. Um, ref your own ref feedback is also useful sometimes, but it's not, it's not enough. You need the external view to really learn effectively. The feedback should be timely, which means it should be as instant as possible. If I say um, a German word wrong, I'm not going to try one. Um, so say, I don't know, I say ein, uh, ein gang, and you go, no, 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 ein right? If you say that straight away, I've just, I've, that's hot in my brain, that word that I've tried, and your correction will have an effect. But if you tell me that in an hour, um, maybe not so much. It, what's a big problem in universities is that they say you have a big assignment to submit and the assignment goes in and then three months later maybe the feedback comes back to the student for that assignment. They've pretty much forgotten that assignment. They, they probably read it and it's like reading a stranger had written that thing. It's too late. It's much better to have small pieces of knowledge being demonstrated and small bits of feedback more often than to have large pieces because you don't really learn. Uh, the feedback should promote reflection. You should have time to, for your brain to absorb the feedback and let the brain change because you are changing brain structure when you're learning. Feedback should be actionable, which means you can take an action to improve. That's important. I can, you are, it's possible to give people feedback where they can't do anything about it. Um, you know, you might say to me, are you very Australian? <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, I can't do anything about that. Um, it's, it, feedback should be something they can take an action on. And preferably, and this goes back to Vygotsky kind of theory, the zone of proximal development, should be something small, a small step. A small piece of action they can do right now. You know, I could say to you, gee, it would be good if you became a psychologist. It's a very, very big thing. It's not very actionable, maybe. Um, so small, actionable things. It should be consistent. If you have a consistent feedback, you know you can, you can react to that. You, you know if you're getting better towards your goal. If the feedback is up and down, it's very hard to, to steer. When you're, when you're learning to drive that car, um, 
you have a constant feedback from the wheels and the, and the steering wheel so that you know, you know when you're on the road. Feedback is not just advice. And often, I think sometimes feedback is like that. It's just, I'm going to tell you some stuff. I'm giving you all feedback on how I think you are as a group. But that's not very effective for learning. Um, and feedback is not just grades. If I give you an assignment and you give it back and I say, yep, 75%, what's actionable? What have you learned? What can you learn from that? Nothing. It's just assessment. So the comments are more important than the grades for, um, for actual learning. And if you're a teacher, you're there to be uh, helping people learn. So that's what good educational feedback looks like. So based on that, how do you build a good Moodle course? Firstly, make sure everyone knows the goals. Often this is forgotten. You need to say, we're here to learn this. And um, that's important. You need to create frequent opportunities for people to represent their knowledge, to post in forums, to make glossary entries, to make database entries, to write on wiki pages, to um, do little to do assignments, to um, to rate each other, to respond to each other. So you want them to make lots of little texts, little actions, many many of them together. And then you need to promote quality feedback. So tell the group that they have to be giving feedback to each other and what's good feedback, the sorts of things I just talked about. How do you get them to give good feedback to each other? It, uh, you know, the very lowest form of feedback would be using a forum ratings that just is like a like, I like that post. That's okay, that's a start. In the very first Moodle course that I ever made, I had the luxury of dealing with master's level education students. They were teachers who had gone back to do their masters. And so they were familiar with educational theories. And I could say to them, I want you to grade, to rate each other's posts on uh, a very specific scale. And it was about the quality of the posts. So they were giving feedback to each other about the, the quality. And it was a scale of separate to connected. Anyway, when I did that, that's when I really thought I'm onto something here with Moodle because the, the, the quality of the overall discussion, because they were thinking in a, in a meta way about each other, it just went, wow! Like there was 20 people and they were just posting non-stop every day and they were all really learning and enjoying it. And they're waking up in the morning and they're checking their email to get in there because it was exciting stuff. Because they were getting really feed, real good feedback. Uh, don't just publish textbooks. Actually, I missed one there. Be timely, obviously. Um, now, this doesn't mean if you're an educator that you have to be up at three in the morning um, working hard to give all this feedback. If you work on, giving, on, on creating the right environment, the feedback will happen naturally and actually you're just guiding it. Don't publish textbooks. You know, don't think, okay, we're making a course to teach this subject. Let's spend a year developing very detailed contents and pictures and videos and we're going to make this, we're going to, everything will be in the videos and the, and the texts. It's, um, it's, rare, it's rare you need to do that because mostly that stuff is already on the internet. It's already in books. It's already out there. You could even get the students to create that content. You make the activities. I want the students to collaboratively create this content and that is the learning activity and they've represented their knowledge and then they get feedback around it. And you didn't have to do all that work of creating the content yourself. Uh, and lastly, don't give grades without comments. Just, you know, if you find yourself doing that, just think that comments are the most important part. I could go through all this, there's, uh, I'm sure, how many people here I would say you're quite familiar with Moodle, you use Moodle a fair bit? Okay, most, how many have not used Moodle very much, it's a bit new? No, okay. <laughs> That's a problem Ralph, we have to speak about this. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so mostly you're pretty familiar, so you know these, these sort of tools, um, all of these, the tools have opportunities to create feedback. 
uh, in your course. Um, forums, of course, assignments, um, quizzes. Obviously, with quizzes, yes, you get a grade at the end. But in the quiz itself, you can automate feedback. You know, if they answer different answers, you can say Moodle should return this feedback to them. So you can actually automate a lot of feedback in the quiz. The choice and the survey module and the feedback module, that's uh, about feedback actually mostly to the teacher. How does the teacher know what's going on in the class? The survey module, which is, how many people have used the survey module? I don't know, what's it called in German, Ralph? Survey, mod survey. What's it called? Frage. Okay. Uh, Umfrage. Umfrage. Um, because I'm, some of these modules are similar, and uh, the German translations may cause confusion, but the, that one. Um, how many people have used that? Umfrage. Okay, a few. Not many, uh, but I'm glad you have, who have. You're the best people in the room. <laughs> um, no, I, I do like that module. But it, what most people don't like it because they go in there and they think, I can't make up my own surveys. This is useless. I can only have these fixed uh, ones to use. But those fixed surveys are instruments that were designed and tested over many, many thousands of students and they have statistical significance. So when you use them, you get a very good, it's like a, 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 a lens, a view on the classroom and how they're thinking and how they're feeling. Um, what's most useful with that is to, you can find the students that are outside of the ordinary, the students who are the outliers, and they're the ones you should be talking to, you know, finding out why they think like that and how you can help them um, and so on. Uh, workshop, obviously it's designed around students giving feedback to each other. The lesson module has some feedback. Um, the, obviously, grades and comments, reports. And as we move in the future, analytics is coming up as um, a big issue. Is, are there too many talks about analytics at this conference? Okay. Well, it's an ongoing subject and a lot of people are working on it. And what's good about it is it's by looking at the data of what's happening in the course, Moodle will be able to, is able to give automatic feedback that is customised per, per person. And just like when you, I was the story of the woman with the, looking at her temperature and could tell a lot about her health and her body from one variable, it may be possible to look at the small data in Moodle and by looking at particular small things to tell something about a person and help them. So from that to the Moodle project itself, I said this was about how to build anything. Well, if you think about feedback, any project you're working on, it, feedback can be a useful concept. So in Moodle, uh, should, everyone should know the goals of Moodle if we're looking to make Moodle better. We should create frequent opportunities for people to represent their knowledge. This conference is kind of is a good one. We can talk to each other about what we know about Moodle. We can get feedback from each other. Um, but also online, we have lots of things going. Um, but quality feedback is the thing. We should be helping each other learn about what online learning is. And we should be timely and fast. We should be thinking about how we can do this quickly. So I wanted to talk about what the, some of the things that we're doing to improve the Moodle project based on this kind of view. But first, what are the goals of Moodle? This is our mission. Um, Moodle's a learning platform. Uh, the professor was talking about this, uh, the MOOC platform, which is built on the Moodle platform. And all of us, when we have a Moodle site, we're building platforms. But Moodle itself is like an operating system for building these platforms. Um, our first goal, and I've put it first, and I even added a love heart because it's special, is that we support teachers with teaching. I'm not interested personally in creating a world where we all learn from computers. We have seven billion people in the world. What are they all going to do if <laughs> no, one's, no one's actually talking to each other? Um, they all need, teachers need jobs, but also there's nothing as good as a human teacher uh, for a long time. I don't see that changing for a long, long time. And you probably, all of you have in your history, 
at least one person, a teacher who was a mentor of some kind, who helped you decide your career, who helped change your view, who, who, who was a, a person that really affected your life. And I don't see that coming from uh, some future artificial intelligence as much as, as a single person. And why, why shouldn't it be a person? So teachers, we, we are trying to help teachers be very effective. We're trying to give teachers the tools to be great teachers, to teach a lot of people very well. Of course, also, we're supporting learners with their learning. Moodle is about integrating things. It's not about doing everything, but it's about integrating them. So the content can be out on the web. Activities can be out on the web. Um, activities can be in a classroom. Uh, you know, the students will be doing things all over the place. But if you're going to call it a course, then you need to have somewhere where these things are tied together. And that's how Moodle is designed as the, the hub of that thing, that course. Moodle is open in every way. The source is open completely. Our development processes are open, and they could be even more open, and I'm going to des describe how. But they are very open. You can see every line of code as it goes through the processes. You can see who did it and why and all that stuff. Um, because we are so open, it means that your sites can be fully private. And I know this is especially important in Germany. Probably Germany is the country that has the most attention to data protection, but which is great and fantastic. And there's no one who followed all this Snowden stuff more closely than I. I think um, to have the opportunity, the choice to say where is my data and exactly how it is manipulated and who has access, to have that choice to be able to do that is important. And that's why I, I, I think open source is, the, is really a very important movement in the world because this openness gives us privacy. And I, I love this duality of the concept. When you have a private company running a server, you have to trust somebody. You have to trust people. And you know, the, the, more, the more it is in the cloud, the more trust you have to provide to more and more people. So obviously, that's fine with many people. And for many situations, that is totally fine. I use Google stuff too. And I, it's no problem with that for me. But I like to also have the choice. And if the moment when we don't have choice, that will be a very sad day. Uh, it's important to Moodle to, that we use, it be, continues to be used for free from any device. Students should not be paying for a device or for a software just to learn. That should always be free. Of course, institutions cost money, people cost money, teachers cost money. You have to enrol in institutions, of course, so that, I'm not saying that should be free, but the technology should be free to use. Uh, we try and actually in Moodle be the most flexible tool set and cover every sector in education. Um, that probably comes from my belief that education principles are fundamental. Things like feedback, it's a very fundamental human process. So if we're building software around those ideas, it doesn't make sense to just focus on one sector or this sector, you know, just primary schools or just corporate or just universities. Um, so we try and do it all. And we do that through our modular structure, and that's why we have so many different variations of Moodle. Uh, Moodle should be able to scale to any size. If you can run a MOOC, why not run a MOOC? If you can teach 10,000 people, why not teach 10,000 people? The more education, the better. And lastly, it's about being a global project. Most people in Australia, uh, the, like if I talk with government or um, um, the tax office <laughs> or anybody else in Australia, even institutions, a lot of them don't even know Moodle is from Australia. You know, sometimes I put up an ad to hire more staff and they yeah, I've heard about Moodle. This must be a Moodle office in Australia, is it? And they go, no, no, this is the main office. And they go, what? So they don't, we don't really make a deal out of it because in my mind, I've always, I'm, I have European parents, so in my mind, uh, we're just, it's just the world. Um, and I think it's very good that if someone is going to contribute to an open source project by spending time 
writing code, spending time developing content um, or techniques that they know, okay, I spent all night working on this thing, but the whole world can use it. It's, it's nice to know that, that, that there's a global project and it can be used. So, um, what is the roadmap of Moodle and what are we doing? This slide is a bit old and it's just showing five main areas that I think Moodle is developing in, in these five areas. Um, so just quickly show this because I want to change this. Um, in the middle, of course, Moodle is a platform. It's a operating system and we need to make it work um, effectively. Developers should be able to make plugins easily. The, 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 fr the, the, the framework of Moodle should make things look consistent and work consistently. It should be very easy to make it look pretty, put a theme across it without much, too much effort, and it should be very usable. So we do those things on the, on the platform. Um, analytics and feedback, there's a big area of development where we approved last year the logging of Moodle. So again, here we are collecting more data about uh, students. Um, but it's the purpose of that is to look for those small data, and maybe the big data, to analyze and get Moodle actually actively computer, it's computer aided teaching and computer aided learning. Um, and also notifications. We all have one of these things on us and it's kind of nice if Moodle can talk to you and say, hey, uh, this forum, something's happening right now. You should really get in there because you want to be timely and give feedback right now. So um, obviously you don't want that message at three o'clock in the morning and you don't want that message about things that you don't care about. So these notifications should be adjustable. So you can say, yes, you know, communicate to me, help me with my teaching, tell me where I need to be so I can be the most effective. And same for the learners. Uh, management stuff. Moodle has not been very good at management on the, on the institution level. It's mostly focused on what happens in a course. So there's still a lot of work we have to do on learning plans, on competencies, um, and uh, things like workflows around an institution. So somebody does something, someone else approves it, someone else implements it. Uh, rollover, we talked about this yesterday, is one of the many topics that the, um, the work in the workshop about the priorities. But some, a big issue with Moodle is what happens at the end of the year when you want to reset everything for the next year. So we don't have really good tools in the middle of Moodle for that. Access, uh, we are doing a lot of work right now on mobile stuff, on making Moodle work uh, well on mobile devices. Uh, we have an app which is developing, I'm going to show you. Um, we also, um, being responsive, that Moodle, this website should work on all devices, etc. Um, but also accessibility for people who are blind. I, I estimate we probably spent 20% of our developer time last year on issues related to accessibility and making Moodle work better um, for people who, who need Moodle to work that way. Interestingly, the accessibility group is one of the only working groups that's not on Moodle.org. And the reason is that they, they're mostly blind and they can't use our forums. <laughs> so we're on a mailing list. Um, so that's like a priority. Let's get the forums and things working really well so that we can have the discussions there in, in Moodle.org. And lastly, the community. We work a lot on the community and structures in the community. How do we improve um, how we do things? Uh, but also building open content and so on. Uh, look, I've got a few random things from the last release to talk about just as examples because there's a lot of things. So one was uh, in 2.8 there was a, a usability and accessibility improvement to the quiz. So the way you build quizzes and questions has been improved. That was one thing that was in 2.8. Um, we also focused on the last release in the gradebook. And we had a big working group for this where we had about 20 people from different institutions. We all met in Los Angeles. They were mostly Americans. 
So I, I had to make sure that they didn't always talk about things being 120%, um, because only in America do they do that, I think. Um, it's a mathematics problem. Um, and uh, we worked uh, very well together to produce an idea of, of the, next level, the next level of development for the gradebook, and we fixed a lot of things. So we now have, in the background there, you've probably seen it anyway, but the, the gradebook now it fills the whole screen, it's very scrollable, it's like a big spreadsheet, it works on any size device. Um, there's also single column and single row views. And when you are um, arranging the gradebook, there's a much better interface that's more clear for how you create this, the structure of your grades, the weights, and so on. It, it was a lot more confusing before with aggregations and things like that. What's aggregations in German? Is that anyone? Someone? Aggregation? That's good. Um, so there were some good improvements. There was a nice step forward, but we obviously have more to do everywhere. I mentioned the mobile app. Um, the current mobile app works on Android, on iOS, and Windows platforms. I think Windows is about 3% of the market. Um, less than that, though, is a Firefox OS, which has, I don't know what percentage of the market. Does anybody here have a Firefox phone? Anyone? No. One, maybe. A half. You have. Okay. Um, it's small, but it's an open source operating system for phones, so we should be on it. it. The only thing stopping us is one technical little glitch, so we can't quite get it out there yet, but we're, we're working on it. Um, but what we've been doing lately is actually uh, prototyping a new version of the app, which I'm pretty excited about, so I'm going to try and show you a bit now. Ugh. Come on. No. There we go. So you can go and look at this on prototype.moodle.net. That's the, the full URL. Um, and we have a little sort of a, a, a little uh, web page there that, that, that uh, lets you test it on different size screens. So you can have an iPad version or a Nexus, see what it looks like on different devices. And we can do this because the, the app is completely web technology. It's all HTML and JavaScript and CSS. But the new framework lets this app um, perform like a native app. It's really much slicker even than the current app that we have in the app stores. So, uh, you know, you have menus like this. You can, uh, you know, when you go to preferences, you have screens that look like this. Let's say we go to messages. It starts looking like pretty much every messaging app you've ever used, WhatsApp or Telegram or Viber or Apple iMessages or Google Hangouts or etc. They all kind of look the same, have you noticed? They've all converged. <laughs> I use Telegram mostly. Um, you can see individual people like that, but when you're looking at messages, the messages look like that, so you have chat. So this is all with only people in your class, of course, in, in your own site. We did a survey recently, we asked people what they wanted, and the number one thing was messaging improvements. People wanted messaging to work really well. So when you get a message, you get notifications, like any chat platform. So it's very natural. Um, you also have notifications of things that are happening in the course. So if somebody posts to a, to a forum, uh, you get a notification about it, and then this wasn't working for me this morning, so this prototype, something's not working. but. You get a notification that something's happened in a forum, and when you click this button, it takes you to the forum in the app, for example. So you stay inside the app. And individual courses, you, you've got your contents, um, which might look like this. And there's a forum, and the forum might look like this. And you, here's a discussion, and I go into the discussion, and you can see all the replies. And it, it's all kind of how you would expect, but it's such surprising in technology how the simple things are the hardest things to develop. <laughs> um, and even the grades page looks something like this. This is what a student might see, very simple representation of their grades. So they can sit there and hit refresh, waiting for you to do their grading. Um, and here's all the participants, etc. So 
just, that just gives you a feel for it. It looks a bit chunky on here because it's on a, it's, on, it's being presented through a web page on this projector, but when you see it in retina on like a, a proper screen, it looks really nice. And all of this design is completely customizable. So the Moodle site you connect to ch can change the whole look and feel of this app. So when you log into your site, it looks like your site and so on. The current mobile app does that too. What's different about this new platform is it's much cleaner and even better, if you add a module, a plugin onto your Moodle site, it can include a file that tells this app how to, how to be the mobile interface for that module. So even third party modules can be accessible natively in the app. So the app will be able to expand and take on all of the Moodle functions. So then we all have to work on making the app support everything in Moodle, but then we can do that. So, and it works offline. So the very, very cool future. So this is, you might know Ionic. This is the Ionic framework, AngularJS, things like that. Okay, so that's something we're working on. This is kind of the bigger things that are on our plate at the moment. And these have been in the queue for some years and we're just getting to them now. So the, 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 the 30 odd people at Moodle HQ, these are kind of our main priorities at, at this moment. First one is navigation improvements and usability. We're trying to reduce blocks. We're trying to get rid of the navigation block completely. Um, and that navigation will be in the right places in the pages a bit more like that uh, mobile app. Well, it doesn't have any blocks. It doesn't look like a web page. Um, so it's about some different things, like bringing all the preferences into one place so you can, s you can set your preferences. Um, editing in place. That was WhatsApp, I think. Um, editing in place. So, um, well, I can show you here, actually. So uh, here I am in Keynote, right? If I want to edit something in here, I want to edit this, uh, this heading, I don't go looking for a settings page under a menu to go and edit that. I just click on it, right? And then I can just start editing it. And most things now, modern stuff, look, works like that. If you want to edit a thing, you click on it and you edit it right there. And then when you click away, it's saved. Um, so that's how Moodle is going to work eventually. We have to that's something we're working on, is how we make all these little things editable in the page and you don't have to move away. Uh, and also dashboard improvements. Um, so the My Moodle page was always a kind of a, just a very initial prototype and I thought that more, more of the community would build great modules in there to make that a very useful page. And it never really quite happened that way. Um, so we're going to pay some attention to that page and we'll probably call it Dashboard. Um, so a bit of a name change to reflect a different focus slightly. The other thing I already mentioned was this competency-based learning, more the management side of things. So we are uh, looking at outcomes and user competencies. So once you've completed a course and that course was listed as uh, addressing some competencies, then you as a user gain those competencies. And we can have a list for every person, every learner. These are the things they've shown they know. These are the things they still have to show they know. And they can work through them. And it's connected to courses, connected to competencies, connected to uh, portfolios also. So we're taking a lot of this code from um, that's already out there in the community. Many people in the Moodle community have built this stuff um, and added it onto Moodle, but we're going to put it into core, so it'll be there from the start. Uh, lastly, and uh, this is more for the techies, I suppose, but for the consistency of the platform, we've got a project called Element, an Element Library. And you can imagine this as breaking down the interface of Moodle into Lego bricks, so that a developer can build a page by just a piece of this, a piece of this, a piece of this, a piece of this. Now, we've always had this sort of thing in Moodle, but it's never been done very well. So we're doing a, a real rewrite through that area to make it easy to develop pages, which in turn makes it usable, makes it accessible, because it's consistent um, and also beautiful, 
because theming Moodle will be easy. You just need to go through a list of maybe 40 components and make sure all the components look nice and then everything else will look nice. So that's the things we have right now. But going back to this, this is the roadmap. You, those things are pretty, uh, most people agree those things we're working on are probably important right now. But I, I don't always know. The, those, that list came from mostly me getting feedback from many, many, many places. I go to Moots, we've got the tracker, we've got the community, we've got Moodle partners who have many clients and they collect a lot of feedback from their, their paying clients. We have um, all of that. And somehow my job is to synthesize all of that into a roadmap for 30 people to work on. It's not ideal because there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on in the community. So I'm trying to improve that. And one of the things, this is a new thing that we're starting, is a Moodle association. And this will be starting in a couple of months, maybe three, four months. Um, it'll be at moodleassociation.org. And it's a full association, it's a separate legal organisation, it's at arm's length to Moodle. It's for end users of Moodle to become members and to work together to decide what the roadmap should be. At least part of the roadmap, because there will be other input too. But a, a, a large proportion, I hope, will be driven by the Moodle Association. So they'll, uh, they'll become members, sign up, put money every year into the, the pot. And then the working groups in there will be created according to what the brainstorming sessions to work out what's important, create working groups around those important things, work together on what the specifications of that thing should be, and then use the money to pay for that development, to pay us, Moodle HQ, to make that stuff. So it's our job to train developers, to be, keep the organisation of, of the, the, all the coding and review processes, but then the Moodle Association is telling us, work on this, work on this, work on that. And so I think we've become a more co cohesive community with the community driving um, a lot of the Moodle future. And I'm very excited about this. I really want to see this um, be a model of development for open source. Um, some other projects have things like this already, but I, I think we can do it better. So I'm quite, yeah, I'm quite keen about this. Another thing we're doing is we are um, moving towards the idea of um, official Moodle moots. What's going on here? Some crazy stuff. I messed with this slide recently and so it's all messed up. Oh gosh, here we go. That's what happens. So um, we now have MoodleMoot.org and what the heck? Okay. I should probably stop looking up there because I have a screen here. The thing is my screen here is not like your screen. All right. All right, there we go. So what are we doing in these official Moodle moots? And why are they different to these Moodle moots? This Moodle moot is the best thing. All the Moodle moots that we've had in the Moodle community are amazing. We've had, they're built by the community. Somebody in the community, in this case, Eladia, stepped up together with uh, the institution here to create this event. And you know, you, you get together as a community to create it. And I, I love that the community is doing these things. Um, they're all different. I go to a lot of Moodle moots. I go around the world. The one in Colombia is not like the one here. It's not like the one in England um, or the US. So they have local flavour, which is really also very good. But I think there's something we can do at these moots to be a bit more proactive with Moodle. So some of the things that are, uh, in, in Australia, sorry, in the Australian Moodle Moot, which is quite a big one usually, it can be 500, 600 people, um, it was being run by um, a company with a sort of more commercial interest and it was starting to get a bit of a commercial flavour. Um, and a lot of people said, oh, we don't really like that, it doesn't feel very community when you're just being told about products. So I, we stepped in to, to improve that, at the same time drive it forward into another direction. So what we'll be doing at, at, at the Moodle Moodle in Australia and also the one in the US, which is run by Moodle HQ, uh, 
We're going to focus on sectors, so K-12, universities, and workplace learning. Workplace includes companies, hospitals, vocational training. They have a lot of similar needs. So because we're on the sectors, we can really focus on um, less about more general things, but we can get more specific um, about how you would use Moodle in a hospital and you know, what's, what's very specific there. Fewer choices. Uh, there is a lot of sessions parallel at this moot, which is really good. And for many moots, you need to do that to cram the, the sessions in. But what I'm going to be trying to go for at our moots is less, because I get so frustrated. I want to see every single thing. And I'm going to miss 85% of what you guys are presenting <laughs> at this moot. Um, well, actually, I'll probably miss 99% because you'll be in German. But um, it, it's, it's very frustrating. And I, I, I like to actually just sit and just have things presented to me. I don't want to move around too much either. Um, so we're going to try and have very, very streamlined. With the sectors, you basically have one stream of uh, shorter quality presentations in one room. And we're going to try this format out. The, the most important part is we're going to be building facilitated design sessions, so working groups, similar to as I just talked about for the association. And probably that'll be very close to what this the association will probably choose those sessions in the future. But it's where we get together, have a face-to-face -face working group on an aspect of Moodle. So we can say, at this conference in this country, everybody come and talk about, say, the rollover process at the end of the year. Let's design that to be the best system it can be. Or let's look at the assignment module. How do we take the assignment module up to the next level? And let's look at all the proposals and all the hacks and all the additions people have made to assignments and let's tie it all together and design the next level of the assignment module. And we can have these projects at different moots all around the world. Um, so the way it's going to work in the Australian moot is on the first day there's a workshop to discuss what the project should be to work out the basic um, outlines. Over the next two days of the moot There'll be discussions online, through um, web pages, through Twitter, people talking over coffee, face to face, twos and threes, to talk about their ideas, uh, refine this document. And by the end of the three days, we should have a pretty good functional specification. What, what do people want this thing to be like? And then on the last day, we have a hack fest. All the developers come together. They look at that spec and then work on the technical challenges and try and design how that should be implemented. And then that will go to Moodle HQ, we develop it, it's in the next release. And so that's one thing we'll do. Um, lastly, uh, we're going to be working on professional video recordings. I'm staring right into this camera right now, which is good. Um, but I, I would like to kind of take it up a notch and try and make the presentations really more entertaining to get them online in one place. So moodlemoot.org Moodle will kind of collect Moodle presentations from all the Moodle moots and just present them as a stream of uh, presentations, which you could subscribe to and have coming in. So if you're familiar with TED Talks in the English-speaking world, <coughs> in German too, yeah. Um, that's, a, that's quite a nice concept. Um, and I, I, I'm thinking of it something like that. So something that's very watchable. You can be at home, you flick on YouTube on your smart TV and just tune in and you can just flip through Moodle presentations on a big screen and it's actually, you know, of a quality that's, you feel like doing that rather than it being work or something. Um, so yeah, that's, that's stuff that's coming up and uh, yeah, moodlemoot.org is where that'll be centred. But beyond that, this kind of, once we, we get the basic framework of these moots, a bit more solid, um, I hope that other moots will maybe take on that framework and that they, you know, becoming an official Moodle moot won't be very much. It's just joining in with this concept and we just have more, more you know, Moodle moots acting in a more consistent way around the place. So, but if they don't, it doesn't matter either because I love all Moodle moots. Someone asked me today, how many Moodle moots have I been to? And I never actually thought to count that. I'm thinking it must be at least 100. Yeah. Um, 
Moodle.org, we're working on Moodle.org all the time. Um, we updated it last year to try and improve the internationalness, if that's a word, of it. Um, the, it's going quite well, we, but there's a lot of st still things to do in there to make the, these language communities operate um, more, more independently, I guess. Um, uh, Moodle.net, oh, I flipped again. How many people know about Moodle.net? Do you know about Moodle.net? A few? So this is our official open educational resource, OER. It's, it's where our content is, and uh, shared content is. There's two things you can do on this site. The first is, if you have a course, or a fragment of a course that you want to publish, you can publish it. You just push the zip file, from your own Moodle, you, you just publish it straight onto here, and other people can download it. Very few people do that. Why? They don't know about it. They're not allowed to because your institution says you can't, because they're a teacher on a very low wage, and they've spent two weeks developing this course, and why the hell should I share it with other teachers who can't be bothered to learn this stuff themselves? Um, there's many reasons. We need to address that. The second thing you can do on there is publish your link to your course. So maybe your MOOC platforms, you could advertise on there your courses in there and people can find them. So there's two things I want to do. The first one, I want to improve the quality of the uploads and I think the association or um, Moodle HQ directly can perhaps facilitate development of open Creative Commons licensed content by kind of crowdfunding the funding for it. <coughs> so we, we find a teacher who's willing to develop it. We work out some sum of money that'll make it attractive for them to spend the time to develop that. We, 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 we reach out, ask people who's interested in developing um, a German level one course, the A1 course um, uh, in Moodle. And we pay someone to develop it. And that way it's developed for this purpose. So there's no problems with licensing from institutions. And it becomes like a template. This, will be, this is so good for a new user to Moodle. If they're new and they're in their Moodle course facing a blank screen and they have to develop a German A1 level course, they at least have something to start with. They've got a template. They can get that. Now they've got something to start with. Then they can change it, play with it delete things, add things, but it helps people get off the ground faster. So there's overall efficiencies, I think, but it's hard to do, and I think we actually need to just find ways to pay people to build stuff. That's the only solution. So that's for the content. For the second part, for the advertising, I want to make it so it's much easier to publish links and that the, when you publish the link, it's attractive. It has a, a picture, it has start dates. If it costs money, it has the price. It has the language, the location, etc. So that you can, this becomes almost like a portal to all the stuff that everyone is doing around the world in Moodle if they want. So that's that. Am I going over time? I think I am probably. This is two minutes. All right. <laughs> um, the we have an active Moodle research program. We had some Moodle research conferences which were really good, but we've decided not to run standalone research conferences anymore because um, they are quite intensive and we find there are probably other ways to do it. So the, the research conferences are kind of built into the, the Moodle Moots, the official Moodle Moots. There'll be a research component. But there are so many areas we could be learning together about online learning. We could be studying these kinds of questions. These are some example questions, some research questions. Is it better? to reveal all the activities to the student at the beginning or to hide them and sort of release them slowly, like gamification. You probably have an idea on that. I have an idea on that, but we don't have the data on that. So we need to be able to doing proper research studies on these kinds of questions because once we know that, we can make Moodle encourage that, which improves quality of education. So I won't, we haven't got much time, so I won't go through those, but you can talk to me about it in the next couple of days. Uh, I've only got two more slides, Andres. Um, we're also running a MOOC ourselves, 
and it's to learn Moodle. Um, we had one in 2013, which was pretty successful. We waited a while. Now I've decided we're going to just run them every six months. So we had one in January, and from now on it's every January and July. It's four, four weeks, and it's to help people learn Moodle. Um, because of this, we, obviously we help people learn Moodle, but we also get feedback from new users, which is really good. It's like an experiment. It's our own research, action research, to see how people are using it. We can study. We have all the data. It's very hard for me to ask universities to give us your usage data. But we have at least one experiment we can play with. And we can test our teaching concepts. We can try different things on different groups. A, B, let's see which one is more effective. So we can do experiments there. And lastly, we can demonstrate the scalability of Moodle and the usability of it. Because um, Moodle, it works as a MOOC platform. It, you know, you can always make it work that way. Um, lastly, I just wanted to mention the Moodle partners, which um, all the funding for Moodle core development comes through Moodle partners. And people like uh, Aladia, Ralph, Ralph from Aladia, are the ones who are, um, through their royalties they pay on us, on the services they do, um, it, uh, it funds what we've done so far, and that will continue. So that's always another part. So support Moodle partners. Lastly, uh, that's it, questions, but I think we got negative time now and I'm in the very wrong country to do this. <laughs> if this was Colombia, they say, hey, keep going, don't worry, have another hour, it's okay, but yeah, I'm very sorry to offend you all. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>